the Middle East, a region on fire. In countries ruled by some of the most repressive regimes in the world, the people are rising. Despite an abundance of natural wealth, the Middle East is for many a place of grueling poverty and shattered dreams. I don't think the West really understands what's happening because underneath it, the main motive of many of the young people in all countries across the whole region has been denied aspirations and poverty. Revolution came first to Tunisia and Egypt, toppling President Zine El Abedin Ben Ali and Hosni Mubarak. I think what happened in Tunisia on 17th of December last year is just the beginning. We are anyone that follows revolution from the French Revolution through the Russian and Chinese and Nicaragua and Iranian and Cuba and all of them. Revolutions are a long process. They can be 60, 70, 80 years and 100 years of a process. We are not even in the introduction of this in the Middle East. If those uh, changes, let's say, the uprisings there are to become real revolutions, it means that popular power has to overcome and supersede the remnants of the military dictatorship, the kind of remnants of the authoritarian regime and the people that are in the situation that perpetuate the previous interests. The spread of uprisings have cost the lives of hundreds of protesters. Elsewhere, uprisings have led to foreign military intervention, with Saudi Arabian troops intervening in Bahrain and NATO forces bombing Libya. The consequences of revolution are spreading across a world gripped by economic crisis and war. Oil is absolutely central to, to the world economy. It's used in pretty much everything. I mean, almost any economic activity you use will have some contact with oil at some point. To put all these things together, you get quite an explosive situation. You get quite a, a lot of potential for, at the very least, kind of political conflict. Uh, there are the other factors that I talked about which are political to do with the crisis in the region, with the unpredictability of my happen in, uh, within a Palestinian context, Egyptian context, Tunisian context, even Morocco, North Af the rest of North Africa, the Middle East is, 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 is in the boil. Uh, uh, what they're talking about Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, we, we witnessed uh, a lot of protests, Jordan and so on. So we're talking about a region which is up in flames. From the New York Stock Exchange to the refugee camps of Palestine, all eyes are fixed on the Arab revolutions. Since World War I, European colonial powers have sought to control the Middle East. So if you look at Western interventions in the whole region, you've got to go back, way back, 18th, 19th century, the endless meddling in Egypt, in Sudan, in Libya, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and all across Saudi Arabia and all over the Gulf states particularly British interference. And the British Empire was a very curious thing because it wasn't always just about land. It was about trade, it was about naval access, it was about the Suez Canal, but it was also about having pliant monarchies in places in, in different countries. Today, with the Middle East producing 35% of the world's oil output, Western dependence on the region remains high. I think there's, there's one of the factors that is going likely to come in over the next few years is, is precisely the way that uh, resources and questions of access to resources are becoming more pressing, I think, for, for all the different, particularly the major economies. Revolutions in these oil-producing nations are a source of concern for Europe. One of the reasons inflation, in particular, is remaining so high is precisely because of the impact of oil over here and of the prices of other uh, raw materials and commodities over there is starting to have on the prices that people have to pay for the goods they're buying. So inflation in the UK is you know, way above, probably double, um, what the targets that the Bank of England would like to see it at uh, has been set at. And it's been like that for some time. And for as long as commodity prices, particularly of central core commodities like oil, remain high, then that's going to continue to be the case. Saudi Arabia is the world's largest oil exporter. 
Despite opposition movements being banned in Saudi Arabia, dissent is being expressed via Facebook groups, solidarity protests for Bahrain, and small demonstrations over unemployment and poverty. If the House of Saud was overturned, who would control oil reserves worth 440 billion US dollars? And one of the risks, I think, one of the calculations that, that I suspect people are making about the Arab uprisings uh, in Washington, in London and in Paris, is that this potentially starts to remove those reserves and control over those natural resources even further from London and Washington and Paris, that actually people start to say, well, it's kind of our wealth and we want to use it to develop our economies. We want to use it to try and give people education and jobs and these other things that people not unreasonably kind of expect to have. So I think one of the fears, it's certainly at the back of people's minds, is that this is precisely one of the outcomes that may occur. And you'd, you'd anticipate it's not necessarily one of the outcomes that people would, in London, Washington, people in positions of power would necessarily like. The Independent recently published minutes of meetings between the British Foreign Office and major UK oil firms. These meetings took place shortly before the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Some worry that oil reserves have been a factor in prompting more recent conflicts. Since colonialism ended, the West has sought to determine the balance of power in the Middle East through arms sales. We see a succession of uh, regimes across the Middle East and North Africa, which have a dictator, which are dictatorial in nature, repress people um, on all levels. They are armed to the teeth by the United States and its allies and they massacre people routinely. This is not new in terms of the repression they practice across the Middle East. The whole thing is extraordinarily hypocritical when you've seen the kind of rhetoric about human rights and all that sort of thing that's been coming out. But, I mean, for Britain, for example, um, our arms industry is a quite large producer within Britain, uh, in excess of 30 billion, of which um, over 7 billion is actual arms exports to other countries. And what's shocking is the indiscriminate nature of those arms sales. And I was reading a list of, of what um, British arms manufacturers have sold to repressive countries like Saudi Arabia, to Bahrain, to Libya, to Algeria, or Egypt, all those countries. They include things that can only be for the suppression of popular un unrest, things like stun grenades, uh, smoke bar bombs, those types of things, but also sniper rifles, a whole range of military equipment. And those have been sold incredibly recently. In recent weeks, concerns have been raised over the kinds of regimes Western governments are doing business with. Well, firstly, they don't look to see uh, how those weapons will be used, and they don't look to see where those weapons might end up. So, for example, um, 2007, Blair was uh, doing big arms deals with Libya. Um, subsequently, it was found out that arms bought by Libya, you know, from other countries as well, of course, it's not just Britain that's being guilty of this kind of thing, they were subsequently sold on or, or pushed on to Darfur, you know, even though there was a UN arms embargo on Darfur because of the abuses and so on, the atrocities that were taking place there. Libya has brought into sharp relief the question of why the West can stomach some regimes, but not others. If you take uh, little Bahrain, for example, uh, this, uh, the population there has been repressed for so long and the recent uprising practically involved uh, the entire Bahraini uh, population, of the nationals at least, of Bahrain. Uh, but the United States, which has its fifth fleet headquarters in Bahrain, it has the biggest military facilities in the world and, uh, in Bahrain. They can remove the king of, in five minutes if they want, but they don't seem, seem to be bothered that the protesters are being shot at, uh, doctors and nurses are being sent to jail for uh, treating injured protesters and so on. Yemen, similar scenario, a huge uprising, but the United States seems to be turning a blind eye. In Yemen, the authoritarian regime of President Ali Abdullah Saleh 
killed at least 45 unarmed protesters on the same day that French warplanes began patrolling a no-fly zone over Libya. But what the West does know is that it is losing power and losing control in North Africa and in parts of the Middle East. So it's Libya has presented it with an opportunity to intervene in a way that the other places didn't. You know, there was no case for intervening, for example, in Egypt because the Egyptians resolved the issue themselves and it's still an ongoing process of change within Egypt. Uh, but because of the way it evolved in Libya, it was, it, there was an opportunity there for the West to go in, you know, for NATO to go in on the basis of the human rights issue, claiming it was humanitarian, but really going in to bring about regime change so that they could, uh, in effect, uh, from their point of view, come up with a political solution for Libya and an economic solution which would be in their interests. Lord General Dannett, former head of the British Army, said it would be an unconscionable betrayal if Gaddafi was allowed to remain in power. The UK has sent military advisers to help the Libyan National Transitional Council. The task that I assigned our forces to protect the Libyan people from immediate danger and to establish a no-fly zone. And I have a clear mission. Uh, the clear mission is establish arms embargo. It's in place. The no-fly zone is in place. We are in the process of protecting civilians, and that will continue. And then the last piece is transition to a designated headquarters, which I, which I suspect will, will be NATO. So for, for me, I think our, our mission is well-defined and, and has a definite end state, and I think we'll, we'll be in good shape with regard to that. And, I, and, I, and I'm not concerned uh, at present about, about mission creep. There needs to be a decision made about his departure from power and uh, as the foreign minister uh, said, his departure from Libya. So I, I don't think there is any mystery about what is expected uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Gaddafi at this time. The possibility of arming Libyan rebels is a source of disagreement amongst the leadership of NATO. Now, I've said what we're doing, which is we're looking at uh, the communications equipment, body armor, we're looking at uh, things short of that. I've said we won't rule things out for the future, but those are the steps that we're going to take, and I think that's right. So they are at a period now where they are try trying to decide which dictator to ditch and which one to prop up, really. Iraq, good example. The people are protesting every week now, but we hear little of it because they, they have their occupation forces still in Iraq, they have a regime which they themselves have helped bring to, to power under so-called democratic elections and so on. The West's decision to pick and choose which regimes it supports seems to be based on something other than humanitarian concerns. Having done such good business with dictators, Western states may well worry that democratically elected governments would not be quite so compliant. Investing in dictatorship, authoritarian regimes, doesn't always pay off. It is a short-term policy that you know the end of it almost by definition. It's the length of the life of the dictator. And when it fails, it means also U.S. national interest is in danger because they can't guarantee that the relationship are with Egypt or with Saudi Arabia or with Bahrain. Those are relationships with a small group. Those are relationships with either a monarchy or a dictatorship. Now, when the tide turns against these regimes, the tide turns also against the United States. This was the case in 1979 in Iran. The relationship, the interest was so much invested in the Shah. When the Shah gone, the, the, the vested interest gone, and the United States in Iran for the next. 32 years. In the wake of the uprisings, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia recently announced that over $100 billion would be spent on welfare and public services, including a 15% raise for state workers. Despite lifting a 48-year-old state of emergency, President Assad of Syria continues his crackdown on demonstrators, which has left hundreds dead. Other reforms in the region have come from Algerian President Abdelaziz Bouteflika, who has lifted the country's state of emergency 
after 19 years. In Jordan, King Abdullah II fired his cabinet and appointed a new prime minister, tasked with carrying out reforms. In Morocco, King Mohammed VI has announced plans for a revision of the country's constitution. Whether these concessions will stem the tide of revolution remains to be seen. The Middle East, a region on fire. I don't think the West really understands what's happening because underneath it, the main motive of many of the young people in all countries across the whole region has been denied aspirations and poverty. The consequences of revolution are spreading across the world, gripped by economic crisis and war. From the New York Stock Exchange to the refugee camps of Palestine, all eyes are fixed on the Arab revolutions. And I'm also proud to carry with me the goodwill of the American people and a greeting of peace for Muslim communities in my country. Assalamu alaikum. In 2009, American President Barack Obama made a speech in Cairo which promised a new beginning between the United States and Muslims around the world. However, the occupation of Iraq continues, as does the decade-long war on Afghanistan. Obama has failed to close Guantanamo Bay, and the US still maintains a strong military presence throughout the Gulf region, including Saudi Arabia. The United States relatively is a newcomer to the Middle East, post-1945. People for, forget that you know, before 1945 there was hardly any interest or presence of the United States uh, in the Middle East. But gradually, during the Cold War, because the Soviet Union at the time bordered with the Middle East, so it became a Cold War issue, it's energy security issue, it's the special relationship with Israel, is the conflict between the more conservative and more radical governments in the Middle East. It's, it's a big market uh, for its co uh, commodities, for weapons. So, you know, some of its major allies are there. So the real issues, the real national interest, American national interest in the Middle East. The United States should worry if the tide goes against the United States and goes elsewhere. Then, then the United States will lose much of the influence. If you look at the situation they faced in Iraq and Afghanistan, I mean, if you look at the bill for Iraq, it's something like $1.1 trillion. Now the United States economy can't afford that. They're going into spending cuts. There's a lot of concern amongst the US population about excessive spending on defense. And of course, Obama's um, going to be going into his election campaign again before long massive spending on a war, another war in the Middle East is not clearly what they want to do. On the other hand, they want to maintain some influence, some strategic significance, they want to maintain resource um, supplies and so on. So it's a delicate balancing act. Despite only 10% of the US's oil coming from Arab reserves, a fixed world price means that any spike in Middle Eastern oil prices would affect everyone in the global economy. The most obvious one is, is the price of oil, which has now gone over $100 a, a barrel for the first time, really since the financial crisis broke out in 2008. And so that's shortly into the Egyptian uprising, about five days into the sort of upheavals that began there. The, the price of oil shot up way above $100 a barrel. It's now over about $126 a barrel. This is very, very high. I mean, it's something of a historic high. America's non-Middle Eastern oil supplies may also be in decline. There is an argument, and it's not actually clear whether this has happened yet, about uh, peak oil, about the idea that actually oil supplies have essentially reached as far as they can get and they're going to dwindle from here on in. Obviously, it's not a renewable resource. Once you use the stuff, it's kind of gone forever. It's kind of changing the balance of power about how people use oil and where you can get oil from. Some of the fields that used to be 
um, well outside of the control of, of OPEC in particular and outside of the control of the Middle East, which would be, for instance, the North Sea or America's own oil fields are actually declining very, very rapidly, whereas the OPEC fields still have a very large amount of oil reserves left in them. So they, as time goes on, are becoming more and more dominant as sources for oil in going into the future. In addition, for many years, the US has maintained dominance over the international monetary system. The IMF is Washington's economic watchdog. When it goes and visits a country, it has a certain amount of power and authority and will attempt to try and steer what that country does in a certain direction. And for 30 years now, the IMF has consistently argued for something called neoliberalism. This is the idea that the government steps away from the economy and you let the free market uh, make major economic decisions. So in particular, in the Middle East, over the last few years, um, in the case of Egypt, probably really for 20 years now, for Libya somewhat more recently, for Syria, say, the last decade, these countries have tried to follow a kind of IMF model of development, which is that they will no longer offer big subsidies for food, they will no longer try and guarantee employment, they will step away from that and allow the free market to step in. And the IMF has been one of the institutions overseeing this process. And it's a process that works to the detriment of ordinary people, but it can work in favour of those in power. There's an uncanny uh, relationship between the IMF and uh, say, giving its seal of approval to an economy and suddenly you get an uprising a bit later. And so every year or so the IMF is supposed to troop round to various economies and do something called an Article 4 consultation. A group of people fly in from Washington, poke around in your economy for a bit, go and meet you know, your finance minister and your prime minister and um, try and keep a bit of an eye on how that country is progressing towards the, the kind of model that the IMF would like to see implemented. And you notice that in Egypt in, in January this year, in Bahrain as recently as December, in Libya in February uh, 2010, um, the IMF turns up and says everything here is going swimmingly. Recent months have seen the loss of several of America's key allies, making their remaining alliances even more valuable. Israel is still a strong ally of the, regardless of anything, Israel is strong, you know, the relationship are, are, are really special and uh, close allies, uh, not, all, not everyone would argue it is in the interest of the United States, but still there is a close alliance. Israel has received more than $27 billion in American military aid over the past decade. Many believe that America adopts dual standards with regards to Israel. The world knows that there are double standards. They see the way that, for example, a no-fly zone is imposed um, in Libya, but there was, there's been no talk about a no-fly zone um, from the US or from our government um, when it comes to Gaza. And of course the big elephant in the room is Israel. Bombs Gaza, kills people in Gaza, imprisons Palestinians, aid flows, recognition flows, trade flows, business as usual. Some Arab regimes are also seen as compliant supporters of the Israeli state. The role that Mubarak played for all those decades was um, not only to um, back up the US and Israel um, in their, in their programme for keeping the Palestinian people under oppression and occupation, but also um, directly economically aiding Israel. For example, 40% um, of the gas that Israel imports is from Egypt, and that was imported at preferential rates. Energy security is a concern for any country, and Israel is, is, is not unique in this sense, the idea of naming for oil and natural gas. The good news from Israel's point of view, that they just discovered huge amount resource of natural gas in the Mediterranean Sea, that can supply in due course Israel a few times over. So in this sense Israel is less concerned about natural gas and they can get most of it need for oil from the international uh, market. What would a more democratic Middle East mean for Israel and Palestine? Israel definitely very apprehensive. When you invest all your foreign policy in, in, in a single leader in a small elite, when this elite disappears, then your foreign policy, policy disappears together with it. And it shows you the folly, not only of Israel, of the European Union, of the United States, everyone that actually have such close relationship, not with people, not with nations, not with states, but with single leaders of a very limited elite. 
So in this sense, of course, it's apprehensive. Israel is very apprehensive. I think instability can always lead to violence and as a result to conflict and war. That's a real issue. And we see it already, the tension rising between Israel and Gaza, and Gaza that might result in the reoccupation of Gaza, might result in the prolonged conflict uh, with the Palestinians in Gaza. I won't exclude it. There is more danger, but it means that you know, must be diplomatic efforts to prevent it without guarantees that it won't happen. I think we welcome the wind of change in the Arab world, a young generation that calls for freedom and modernity. I think that's the future. I think all of us have to support them. But some see other possible outcomes for the Arab revolutions. There have already been calls for a no-fly zone over Gaza from Egypt and Turkey. If there is an Egyptian proposal, Turkey will give full support. And if there could be a joint proposal, we are ready also to work. Well, obviously, it's going to make um, a significant difference to the struggle for Palestinian freedom. It's a matter of time now before um, those, uh, the gates in Rafah, are broken down. The question remains of what the future holds for the Middle East. The events that are now taking place in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia have enormous implications. If the pressures build up, that the king of Bahrain falls, then the king of Saudi Arabia, the whole kingdom, is going to look pretty shaky at that stage. If all the power of Saudi Arabia can't defend the king of Bahrain, then who's going to defend the king of Saudi Arabia? Who's going to defend the House of Saud? It's not only Israel and the world is, you know, put into this equation, Iran, put into this equation what's happening in Syria, the relationship with Lebanon. If one of the dangers of revolutions, a revolution can descend into conflict. The increasing disconnect between the super-rich regimes and their impoverished subjects has set the Middle East on fire. The domino effect of revolution has already brought down two dictators and several more are hanging in the balance. This is an uprising against neoliberalism. It's not like what happened in 1989 where you have an uprising essentially in favour of democracy, in favour of a kind of liberal democracy, and then neoliberalism turns up after it. That isn't quite what's going to happen this time round because it was already happening. And because it was already happening, it was producing the unemployment, the rising food prices that actually led to revolts in the first place. So it's going to be very hard, I think, to simply turn around and say, OK, we've got rid of the dictator, now we're just going to have this neoliberal model of development and everything's just going to carry on as it was before. Well, I think the, the West needs to accept that the Middle East is a collection of sovereign countries and the people of those countries must determine the development of those countries, they must control the resource of those countries, they must decide on their own politics, on their own economic situation and what role they want to play in the world. They must decide their own alliances, for example. And the West has to stop seeing the Middle East as its own backyard that it has the right to control. It has no right to control any of those countries or any other country in the world and it has to learn that lesson. And the longer it takes them to learn the lesson, the more it will cost the West, the more suffering it will bring to the peoples of the Middle East. But ultimately, that is what will prevail. But how would the West respond to such demands? Every European country's military is faced with cuts at the moment because of the economic problems of, the, of Western Europe. Every one of them wants to show that they're important and necessary and needed. And all through the debate in the House of Commons, there were demands, particularly from Conservative MPs, to restore military spending, to make sure the Army and the Air Force and the Navy have the facilities that are necessary. So this is part of a process that looks at military solutions all the time. There's got to be some different and better way of doing things. International public support for the Arab revolutions is high. People are cheering across the world as popular protest seeks to redress decades of injustice. What 
the Egyptians showed us was we together can take um, power into our own hands and change the course of history. If this shows anything, it shows that people are not prepared indefinitely to accept that kind of condition often for a period of time because of the balance of forces, because of political or military factors, you know, people do find themselves in a subordinate state, but that never lasts. History shows us that never lasts and people will take control of their own futures. As new protesters draw strength from their brothers and sisters in neighbouring countries, their pursuit of justice, human rights, free speech and a fair share of the world's resources continues. The people of the Middle East have broken through the barrier of fear and oppression. The fight for change has begun. Thank you.